still continuing on with this who is this Jesus series question is who is your father well it's a rhetorical question so I don't expect you to answer <laughs> If, if you have seen the uh, movie Star Wars, how many of you have seen the movie Star Wars? Oh, well, the whole thing. <laughs> any, any episode. Yeah, a lot of us. All right. um, before this latest episode, which is number seven, um, I had to go back to the old ones. You know, the second and the third in the series, which is actually, actually the fifth and the sixth. I had to go back, watch it again, try to figure out, all right, uh, we got to prepare for this next one, the seventh, because you don't know what's going to happen on the seventh. It's probably going to, um, some of the parts of that story will probably hark back to the old uh, episodes. And so I did. There's that one very important part in the sixth episode, which is actually the third, no really. It's the third, but actually the sixth. You never know, right? <laughs> it's a confrontation between Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker. And they're fighting. Luke doesn't know who his father is. They're fighting with their lightsabers, then um, towards the end of that fight, Luke's right hand got you know, cut off. And he's hanging on for dear life what at the edge of this whatever that is, Death Star or whatever. And he's about to fall um, down into a very, very deep abyss. It's probably out there in space. And Darth Vader stretches out his hand and says, I am your father. And Luke says, of course, no, you're not. You're not my father. I am your father. No, I'm not. No, you're not. No, no, no you're not. I'm confused. <clears throat> we find that very same um, tension, that conflict, in, in many places, in many families, in, in, in many situations. And in fact, if we look back at the scriptures, we find that tension too. When Jesus was driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit, Satan comes in and he says, if you are really the Son of God, or if you are really the Messiah, do this, do that. Before he was driven to the wilderness, we find this scene. Jesus, verse 29 of John chapter 1. The next day, John saw Jesus. Now, John the baptizer, often known as John the Baptist, he's out there in the Jordan River and he's baptizing. And you know what? That place where he baptizes, um, there's been some research and study on that now recently, and they figured out it's got to be that place. That's where John the Baptist was. Same place where the Israelites crossed the Jordan into the Promised Land. And the same place where Jesus was baptized. John the Baptist was there. He's baptizing everyone. He's saying, repent, be baptized. And so he baptizes them in water. But one day, John sees Jesus coming toward him and says, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now that's a revelation coming from God. He didn't know that beforehand, but as he saw Jesus, he says, Look, it's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. The man who was before me is now in front of me and he's going to surpass me. Now, would you believe this? John the Baptist is cousin to Jesus and that John the Baptist is older than Jesus by age. And yet he says, here's the one who was before me. That's a revelation from God. Verse 31, I myself did not know him, and yet they were cousins. 
But the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. It's a revelation. The Greek word is epiphany. Now how many of us know that uh, a few days ago was the feast of the epiphany? Then John gave his testimony in verse 32. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. Now this particular uh, story in the scripture is so rich, so terribly, amazingly rich. There's a lot of imagery here. We'll see those imagery, imagery later on. Verse 33, And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water. Now who sent John? That's right. Father, God, the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. The one on whom the Holy Spirit comes like a dove and remains. Now in the Old Testament we'll see the, if you read the scriptures, and they're always worried about the Holy Spirit, especially like David or Saul, worried that the Holy Spirit will depart from him. That's in the Old Testament. But John says that he was instructed by God that the man whom you see, upon whom the Holy Spirit will come like a dove and remain, never to leave, remain on him, he's the one. The one. Now, verse 34, and John says, concludes with this, I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. This person, this Lamb of God, this person who just got baptized, this is the one. He is the chosen one. He is the Messiah. He's the one we've been waiting for. And it's amazing, the guy's name who just got baptized, his name is? In Hebrew, his name is? Yeah, Yeshua, which we would translate if we were in the Old Testament, Joshua. The same guy who led Israel through the Jordan River, his name was Joshua. Now here comes another Joshua, a second Joshua, goes to the Jordan River, goes to the same spot where they crossed the Jordan River, and he takes over from there. Amazing, isn't it? He's the chosen one. The one who leads you through the Jordan River is the one who leads you from that place in the Jordan River into the Promised Land. He's the second Joshua. Let's go to the parallel of the scripture. Mark chapter 1, verse 9. This is a parallel. Now, notice that John doesn't tell you about the details of how he was baptized. And there was a voice that came from heaven. But he tells you only about the, the transaction between John the Baptist and Jesus and his disciples. John testifies to the fact that Jesus is the chosen one. Now in Mark chapter 1 verse 9, the parallel scripture here, actually every gospel book has a story about the baptism of Jesus. I will read only Mark chapter 1 verse 9. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth where he lived in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. So he travels that distance, goes straight to the Jordan, the same place where Joshua and the Israelites crossed and where John was baptizing. He goes there, straight there, and then verse 10, just as Jesus was coming up out of the water. So, we, we break into the story, not as he was coming into the water, but as he already comes out of the water. So just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open. 
Now it's amazing that the, script, uh, the description here is heaven was torn open. Do you remember any place where something was torn? The veil, right? The veil was torn. Now also, do you remember any place where something was was split? Open? Red Sea. And where else? The Jordan. Right. The Red Sea was split open. The Jordan River was split open. And the veil was torn from top to bottom. He saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit coming out of heaven descending on him like a dove. Now this is the story is being told from the point of view of Jesus. Verse 11, and a voice came from heaven. Now this is not the voice which you guys watch on TV. It's a voice. Remember a place in the scriptures where there is a voice that speaks out over the water? Where is that? Genesis chapter 1. Creation. Right? There is another place in scripture where there is a vast expanse of water that covered the whole earth. Where is that? The flood. Noah's flood. So all this being done on the water, there's a voice, there's a dove, there's water. Brings back memories, right? And a voice came from heaven saying, You are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Now this is fascinating. We'll go back to this same verse later on. But the word epiphany means a manifestation of the Son of God. It's a manifestation. I want to take this time right now and let's just pray. Let's pray for that manifestation of God. Let's all bow our heads. Or you can lift your head up to heaven just like Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name we just come to you. We thank you for the manifestation that you showed when Jesus was here on earth. Lord, we ask for your manifest presence at this time. We ask for the Holy Spirit to come and minister to each one of us through this message and at the end of this message, at the end of this service, in Jesus' name. Epiphany means the manifestation of the Son of God. Here was a great epiphany in the story of the Scriptures, in the story of God. Really, the Bible is about a story about God. We, we tend to think it's a story about Israel. Well, really, it's a story about God from beginning to end. And this happening, this incident where Jesus was baptized, this is a manifestation of who God is. A manifestation of who God is. Let's go back to the story of Noah. Noah built an ark and God drove animals, land animals and birds into the, the ark. He didn't care about the sea animals because they could survive the flood. But in that ark, Noah and his children and their wives and his wife, they were there, eight people all together. And after so many days, they've been wondering, man, when is this rain going to stop, right? And here in Las Vegas, we never ask this question because the rain comes and it's over in less than an hour, right? Just a flash flood. But they, it rained forever. The only question we have here in Las Vegas is when is the heat going to stop? <laughs> Noah's question was, after all, more than a hundred days, he was asking, man, when is this rain going to end? Eventually, the rain ended. But the flood waters had not receded. So after a while, he sent out a bird, came back. Sent out another bird, came back. Finally, he sent out third time, another bird. Dove, really. Didn't return. Came back later on with a leaf, 
an olive leaf. That's why that olive leaf is very symbolic in, in the Old Testament the scriptures. Comes back with a leaf. It's a dove. A symbol of peace. Peace between God and his enemies. See, the flood is a symbol of destruction, of death, of judgment. A symbol of the end. But it's also a symbol of the beginning. Where he sends a rainbow saying, this will never happen again. This will never happen again. Because destruction is over. Never will I destroy mankind. Judgment is over. I send peace. We find this fulfillment in Christ. Because Christ goes to the water, baptism, and the scripture describes Noah's blood as a baptism, an immersion in the water. Through that baptism, God declares it's done. Destru destruction is over, no more judgment. Satan is judged, for my children, I'm sending them peace. Enjoy and comfort. This is the end and the beginning. Beginning of a new creation. See, God destroys all creation and starts a new one. It's a symbol of the new creation through Christ. The crossing of the Red Sea. God parts the Red Sea. And Israel, who were slaves, walked through that Red Sea on dry land. And as the Egyptian army was pursuing them, God closes the Red Sea and destroys the army of Egypt. He destroys every one of them. And so Pharaoh is left with nothing. It's a symbol that whoever is pursuing us, that death, the destruction, the slavery, the darkness, the dark force of your fan of Star Wars, that's ended. Sin is no longer, has no longer has a hold on us. All that has been destroyed through the Red Sea. But the problem with the Red Sea is they make it through the Red Sea. They go to the wilderness. They were told by God after a um, few days before they enter the Promised Land, Jesus, uh, God says, go enter the Promised Land. Send 12 spies. They came back and reported, we can't do it. The people are too huge. We can't fight this battle. God's not going to help us. We're just going to die here. You know, He took us out of Egypt so that we can die in the Promised Land. Hello? Relief? He took us out of Egypt so He can kill us in the wilderness. And so God said, you're not going into the Promised Land. Anyone 20 years old and above will not enter the Promised Land. So the problem with the Red Sea was that they never entered the Promised Land. Only those who were younger than 20 years old. Including Joshua. Was probably younger than 20 years old at that time. Moses himself did not enter the Promised Land. Remember that? See, the, the imagery here is that we may cross the Red Sea just like Israel, but never enter into the rest. That's what Hebrews is all about. The writer of Hebrews says, if it's really Paul or not, we don't really know. But the writer of Hebrews says that we may have crossed the Red Sea, we may have come out of Egypt, but we have not entered the rest. Why not? Because the rest is not the Sabbath. Because the rest that Joshua brought Israel into was only the Promised Land, but that's not the rest. The rest is Jesus Christ. He is the rest. 
all of this just suddenly merges into Christ's ministry. See, that's a symbol of the old covenant. You can come across the Red Sea but never enter into the Promised Land. That's why you'll hear me saying always, the old covenant was not promised to us. If we think that the Ten Commandments and the, the law and the old covenant is what brings us life, we're all wrong. Because Jesus said, life is in me. You search the scriptures and yet life is already here. You look at the scriptures and look for life and yet life is already here and you refuse it. See, there is no, there is glory in the old covenant, but there is one more glorious that's given to us. It is the new covenant in Jesus Christ. See, that's the problem with the Red Sea. You can cross, but never enter the promised land. Stuck in the wilderness. But Joshua leads Israel through the Jordan River. You know what? We remember this. They were told by God to pick 12 stones from the river and bring it up to the other side, to the West Bank. We know it now is the West Bank. And set up those 12 stones, one on top of the other, as one stone for each tribe, as a mem memorial for all of Israel to realize that, hey, God brought us into the Promised Land. But you, do you remember that God also said, take 12 stones from the East Bank and drop them into the middle of the river? There are 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan River, buried in that river up to now. See, the old has been buried through Christ. And Christ comes out of the river, out of the water, into a new life. We are a new creation. And once we are in Christ, baptized into Christ, not baptized into Moses, but baptized into Christ, we become part of Christ. We are in Christ. And as He is brought out of the water in that baptism, we are brought out of death into life. See, we're going to have a baptism after service this afternoon. And it just so happens, this is my scripture too. This is my topic. I just like, wow, all right. Joshua leads Israel through the Jordan River. The tabernacle comes before them. And then the priests stop in the middle of the river, the dry riverbed. And the rest of Israel crosses through the Jordan River. And as they come out of that river, the water comes back and covers those cross stones. How big is that river? It wasn't really that big. And I thought, man, for a long time I would read the scriptures and say, that crossing of the Red Sea, that was far more glorious than the crossing of the Jordan River. How big is that Jordan River? If you look at the next slide. It's that big. That's all. I mean, you can swim it. Actually, if the water was not as deep, as it is, you can walk through it. People go there now, they go down those steps. This is, we're looking at Jordan, the country of Jordan from Israel. That's Jordan over there on that other side. That's all that is between the West Bank and the East Bank. That's how wide. We, we won't even call it a river, right? Probably call it what? A stream. That's all it is. It's probably wider in other parts. But where, did the, where the Israelites cross, that's all it is. You need God to open the waters there? <laughs> you can just cross, man. <laughs> that's, that's all it is. But this is the place where Joshua crossed the Jordan River. So that's the next slide. This is the place where Joshua crossed 
the Jordan River along Israel. This is also the place where Jesus was baptized. And that's why people do pilgrimages now, they go there and be baptized. Some of them, like, like I think it was my, one of my nieces, or two of my nieces, I don't remember. They got baptized already. I was the one who baptized them. I think they got baptized again. <laughs> just, you know, just to be part, just to know what it feels like to be there with Jesus. It's murky now, it looks, you know, muddy. But before it was probably... Oh, the water. Yeah, it was probably clear. Except that the Jordan, when there's a flood, the Jordan just, you know, all that mud goes into the Jordan River. Let's go back to verse 11. Let's imagine Jesus right there. He comes out of the water and a voice came from heaven. There's a voice of thunders from heaven. And this is not the only time that this voice will speak in the ministry of Jesus. This voice says, You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Before this, there is no incident. Before this, 30 years, Jesus is not performed in miracle. Before this, Jesus does not do any kind of ministry. Until this actually happens, and until the Holy Spirit comes and alights on him and abides with him, Jesus did, did not do any ministry. But after this, he comes with power and authority. Question for us is, who is your father? And don't think it's dark Peter. See, we might say, my father is God. Just like the Israelites say, no, our father is Abraham. You, you don't know who your father is. You're a bastard. <laughs> we might say this, I know God's my father. My father my king. A lot of us probably know our father. Some of us probably know our fathers from a distance. Like I knew my father from a distance. Because he was not that affectionate. No, no, why? He was the son that I was waiting for. My brother was born number two. I was born number eight. So he waited five children before I came. And, uh, and my sister who I followed, I followed her after nine years. I was born when my mom was already almost into menopause. But he wasn't that close to me. And all I remember was that every time he looked at me, he said, shh, stop, keep quiet. I'm watching the TV. I'm watching the news. I'm watching boxing. That's the way he would watch boxing. He was a fan of Rocky Marciano. And Joe Lewis. I remember those names, I didn't know who they were. I just know they're boxers. <laughs> so, who is your father, really? And before I could answer that question, there was a time when I just went to conference after conference, worship service after worship service, prayer after prayer, and suddenly God would come to me in a vision. And I would see God with his hands like this, unlike my father his hands like this and his eyes looking at me with tenderness rather than eyes with anger. I have a niece, my brother's daughter. One time I looked at her like like this and she said, oh man, don't look at me like that. You remind me of my dad. I said, really? And after that I was very careful with my own eyes. <clears throat> And I didn't know because my children didn't tell me that I would look at them like that too. But in a vision, I would see God looking at me with His hands like this and look at me with tenderness, saying, I love you. You're my son. And until that happened, I didn't feel that connection, that personal connection. 
I'll tell you the story of my wife. I'm sorry, I'll I'll be go over time. But I'll tell you, my wife's not here, she's back there, so I said, I'll just tell you a story, is that okay? And she gave me permission, thank God. <laughs> this is her story. She was born number number four. She has one sister who's number six. And she felt like, you probably heard this story in the open arts, but she felt like her mom never loved her, didn't love her. Because every time she would come home with a screamed knee, her mom would, instead of comforting her, pinch her and scold her. Now she would come home all dirty because she had been laying in the dirt and then her mom would get mad at her. And she felt like, wow, why? She doesn't love me at all. And yet, and then she would compare how her mom treated her sister, and her sister was like the baby, the favorite. And he felt something was wrong. With her. She felt something was wrong. With her. She couldn't put a finger on what was wrong. She just felt unloved. For a long time, she felt unloved. She became a Christian, and then, you know, she had this relationship with God, but it was not until the year 2000, not until the year 2000, 80 years into being born again, that God suddenly came to her. In her room, she was praying, and she was lamenting the fact that she didn't have this good relationship with her mother. And then, she finds herself in a dark place. It was like she was in, the, in her mother's womb. And she started crying and weeping. And then she felt that same rejection that she had back there in the womb. And then she hears the father in this, in her prayer. And the father says, Get now how that uh, scripture in Jeremiah goes. Uh, you were formed and wonderfully made. I made you. I formed you. And you are not an accident. Because my, my, my wife thought she was an accident. And in fact, she, um, um, she was born like nine months after her brother, her older brother. So she, she was thinking, maybe I was, I was like an accident because, you know, it was, she came too soon, right? But, but God in that vision said to her, you're not an accident. The day you were born, I ordained that. I ordained that very day that you were born. So you're not an accident. And after that, she came out of that time of prayer Totally renewed. And then years later, I think one or two years later, she gives that as a testimony in a conference that we had. We had this power evangelism conference which we handled in, in one of the cities in the Philippines. And I was the ringleader there. So I asked her if she could come and give a testimony. She gave that testimony. And then she looked out into the audience, she realized that her mom was there. <laughs> And her mom had tears in her eyes. She didn't know. And after that, their relationship had been very, very close. In fact, years after that, her mom got baptized. And she was born Catholic, very staunch Catholic, until eventually she realized she didn't have that a close, intimate, personal relationship with God. So she got baptized. I baptized her myself. So who is your father? What is his declaration over you? Every one of us has a unique need from the father. What is his declaration from you, for you, over you? What is, his, what, what is he going to tell you? Or what has he told you? And maybe he still has some more. Even if he did, decades ago, I find that out. You know, he has something for me. 
So today, that's the question we want to ask the Lord. Father, what is your declaration on it? Is it just like Jesus? This is my son. You are my son, son whom I love. And I am pleased with you. Or is it something else? So, we're going to spend some time here. We'll just listen to music. We won't be singing. And I'd like to invite you to just close your eyes and just listen to the song. And then after the song, we'll just have a few seconds of silence. And then let the Holy Spirit just continue to speak to you. Let that voice from the Father come and speak life over you. Is that okay? Now we'll just pray and then we'll have the song, right? Father, we just come to you. And we thank you for Jesus Christ and what he did. Going to Jordan River, being baptized, and coming out of that, we, we identify with that. We are part of him. We are in him. Just as he is in you, we are in him. And you are in Christ. So Father, we now submit ourselves to you. We ask for the Holy Spirit to come, minister to us. We ask for your voice to come and pray. Thank you. Let your presence be made manifest here. An epiphany for each one of us in Jesus' name.